We're coming in hot to give you our hot takes on all the latest mental health news. From headlines and memes to developments and breakthroughs. We go into this show blind with the hopes of learning something new. Before sharing some bunny hugs. And leaving with our eyes wide open. I'm Nick. And I'm Todd. And this is Mental Health Headline Hot Takes. We're glad you're here. Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Mental Health Headline Hot Takes. I'm Nick. I have Todd here. And we are spinning Hello. the wheel to make the deal. For you can say stop again. If if I'm being predictive here, based on past experiences, I will not have any chance of winning this spin. But stop. Spin again. <laughs> stop. <laughs> Nick goes first. Oh, wow. Okay. I guess if you complain enough, the wheel on rigs. <laughs> <laughs> so um mine isn't exactly an article today but i thought this would be interesting to talk about for you and i um the you can foundation unscripted cast advocacy network celebrated its one-year birthday recently happy birthday thank you and um i you know it, it's it's this along with a lot of other things going on um have really sort of gotten me thinking a little bit differently about this stuff and my role. So for those of you who don't know, I started the UCAN Foundation with a, a few other folks co-founded, co I should say. I co-founded the UCAN Foundation. And um, the purpose was in response to my experience on Love is Blind and post Love is Blind and the aftermath and the giant gap that I saw in several areas of that whole process, right? So the UCAN Foundation is dedicated to providing mental health services and legal services to um, past, present, and future reality cast members because the industry is very exploitative. Um, it's a churn and burn. It's cheap. And somehow cast members are oftentimes exploded, um, exploded, exploited. <laughs> That's I wouldn't be surprised show. to find out if some actually got exploded. So <laughs> uh, we're getting there. But um, uh, in terms of, of that, um, we're also advocating for change in the industry. So the industry of reality TV has escaped any regulation or labor laws that are in the workplace. So they can really get away with uh, having people work long hours, do things that are unsafe. Um, they're very manipulative uh, of people and they're their, um, um, their mental health, their triggers. And so this was my response to uh, leaving the reality TV industry better than I found it and paving a road as uh, a, a path for others to follow so that we can come together and change this industry and, and make it less exploitative. Um, you know, people's lives literally get ruined. But what this last, the reason I wanted to bring this up today is so I was once again featured in an article, um, pretty much a, an essay, expose of uh, whether or not Love is Blind is a toxic workplace. And in this article, which I will link below, uh, this article is headlined, Is Love is Blind a Toxic Workplace? Reality TV contestants are barely paid and the experience can feel like abuse. Former cast members of Netflix mega hit are speaking out and calling for solidarity. And this is by Emily Nussbaum published May the 20th. Um, so I have, uh, I wanted to kind of tie all of this together for, for two reasons of things I wanted to say. One, looking back on the progress that the UCAN foundation has made and the impact we're already having on the industry. Um, and I could list those. There's also a link to our post, um, on our Instagram that has more, more of this information, but we've really made an impact in so many ways in the industry. Um, just by being vocal and giving people space to be vocal. We've had over a hundred cast members that have come to the UCAN foundation to speak with us. Um, all over the course of a year, we have hundreds of mental health professionals that have joined our network across all 50 states. We have dozens of lawyers and attorney firms um, from a labor perspective and entertainment perspective that are in our database. We've connected cast members with those mental health services and with legal support um, in so many ways. And what this year that went by really quick for me um, and then tied up with this article 
it really has me reflecting on the work. And I'm not someone who likes to take a lot of credit. I'm not someone who I'm a reluctant leader, I say often, where I'll lead when no one else will, but I will give every other person the opportunity to take ownership and leadership on something before I do it. That's kind of what I felt happened here, right? I had to do it because somebody had to do it and no one else was doing it. So this and a lot of my thought lately in my own head has been, why am I doing this? And what is my purpose for doing this, right? And so the year, the article, my own reflections, um, as you know, I, I trauma response, keep myself very, very busy all the time. Um, so I don't have to sit with my thoughts. So I've been trying to do that. And what I've realized is that my story is in the middle of my story. And I get goosebumps when I say this, because this is a hard, it's like a hard thing to realize. I thought when I was divorced publicly and everything didn't go the way that I had planned and my whole life was disrupted and my whole life was ruined, that the end of my story was getting away from all of this and getting back to my reality and getting back to the way my life was before any of this. And mm -hmm. I realized through this last year that I'm in the middle of my fucking story. And this is my story that I have um, reluctantly taken back control of by not being silenced by NDAs and recognizing the legalities of all of this and doing all this work that I've been doing. And so not to toot my own horn, but this is my story and I'm in the middle of it and I'm the one telling it. It's not going to be some reality TV show. It's not going to be the media. It's going to be me. And I'm leading here and there are people and someone called me a trailblazer the other day. And, and I like the term because I stepped up when no one else would, I risked everything because I felt like I had nothing to lose. And, um, now there's more and more people speaking up. There's more lawsuits for illegal activities from reality TV. And it's, it, there's more and more coming all the time. There's more coming. Like I know of more coming that we've, we've helped with, uh, throughout the UCAN foundation. So, um, that, and just the little tweaks and changes that we've seen, like love is blind cast members are getting aftercare therapy paid for now. Now there's some shady ass caveats that they try to put with that, but like <laughs> that was nearly impossible for, for me to find when, when I was going through that. And so I am proud of us celebrating one year. I'm proud of the progress we've made. I want to be clear too, like this isn't for me. I will not get anything out of this except finishing my fucking story. And um, yeah, it, it's just, it's amazing to look back on the accomplishments. It's amazing to know that it was all like done out of passion. Like there was no money made. Um, and so kind of all of this stuff coming together has made me realize that my legacy, which I've been thinking about a lot lately uh, in all of this is my legacy is that I'm turning my experience into serving others. Yeah, that's all with you can. Hmm. And I guess the birthday kind of helped me with everything else going on, reflect on all of that. And I just wanted to share that um, we're changing this industry and everyone who, who is with us and everyone who's supporting us um, and in solidarity with us, this is all of you too. You're part of this story. So, um, you know, I just wanted to say happy birthday. You can, um, congratulations to honestly myself and all of the other people that have helped make this thing float. And we've started to see real change and change doesn't happen overnight, especially when you're going up against such a big conglomerate. And so I just wanted to thank everybody who has helped us this last year from a PR perspective, uh, Sarah Fruman, our publicist doing all volunteer work, our social team, um, Ruthie and Hope, wonderful, uh, doing a great job on our social. Um, obviously the board of directors, which everybody I think knows by now, but uh, more importantly, everybody out there who is supporting us because without other people, none of this would matter, right? So um, happy birthday to us. Happy birthday to all of you. And let's let's get this done is my message there. And I know it's something that you and I had talked about when we first got connected. So I know you watch mm -hmm. reality TV. You're very supportive of the mission and everything. So um, yeah, I, I want to thank you too for that. 
And we didn't even have to get the gratitude spin. <laughs> uh, okay, my story. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, I'm very, 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 very proud of you. Um, uh, it's Thank amazing. You. And I mean, to, to have these people, you know, be held accountable. Well, I don't even know if they're being held accountable, but they are now. Someone's like, saying maybe they not should for be their held accountable. Stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I had no idea until I talked to you just how many people's lives are being affected by these shows. And then and I'm, I'm talking to talk- another one later today. It's yeah. Yeah. It's just awful. I, I know you always hear that. Well, you signed up for it, but I mean, those you people up for aren't it, serious but... people. If they, if they, if they really think that they're not serious people. Yeah. I mean, I've signed up for stuff and didn't realize what that exactly entailed and what, you know, what exactly. was, what was going to be the, uh, uh, what's it called? Coll- collateral damage after right. and stuff. And so, um, and I mean, this is minor stuff I'm talking about. And like my life didn't change. Whereas like folks like you who thought, Oh, this would be a cool adventure. And you know, here's the contract, whatever you sign it. And then, and I read uh, the contract yeah. too. Like I, people, this is like, people drive me nuts. Cause they speak about this. Like they have any idea, even though they've never experienced it. <laughs> and, yeah. um, you know, it, it, I read the contract, but when you don't live it, the contract's just words, right? I didn't exactly. know how I was going to feel when I was being filmed 18 to 20 hours a day, not sleeping completely out of my structure. Like you, you can't plan for that. There's no way to plan for that. So that's just Mm -hmm. one of the things, but people, um, you know, people who say you signed up for it, if they're, but you did sign up for it, but changed my mind. Cool. Let's talk. If they're, you signed up for it and mic drop, like you're not a serious person and you don't deserve to be engaged on the topic. Mm -hmm. Or they're, yeah, they're so, I don't because I know people that are reality TV fans and they just refuse to hear the negative stuff about it. <laughs> well, like... I think what it does, and I've been thinking about this a lot, and I want and I start saying this phrase too, like when someone's telling their experience and it's negative, like you as a viewer, there's a sh- there's a shame element I think that can be there, and you don't want to face right. it. And yeah. the bottom line is like no one's faulting you for watching or enjoying reality TV. I'm just mm-hmm. saying, like, as a viewer, assume some of the responsibility to at least fight for better treatment. Like, I'm not saying mm-hmm. stop watching reality TV. I'm just saying, like, mm-hmm. be a part of the right side of history, which is what we're doing with UCAN Foundation and all of the people that are supporting it. Right. And, mm-hmm. you know, I had so, to. I mean, tie- there's no reason you can't make these shows ethically and still have the same product. Exactly. That's exactly yeah. it. People are dramatic and they will be dramatic and you don't have to escalate situations to complete an utter chaos to get that. Right. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, what I say, this is, you know, the stuff that happens to people, people lose their jobs. People have lost their lives. People have been severely Mm -hmm. injured. Mm -hmm. Uh, Their mental health just trashed. I lived that with, you know, my, my ex-wife too lived that. And um, there's a, you know, there's a responsibility there, I think as a viewer to, acknowledge people who have been damaged or victimized by an industry um, without any real takeaway from it or tangible thing, which by the way, I don't care how much you pay me. Like you can't abuse me. Like I'm a human being, you know what I mean? And I think like Mm -hmm. what's become so important to me with this whole, like, I have to finish this. This is my story. I'm in the middle of it is because Mm -hmm. what, what happened to me is I, I felt like I was lacking a personal connection to it. And I think Mm -hmm. that by recalibrating how I think about it, um, and how this is, you know, this is for my healing. This is my, and my therapist said this, this week, Mm -hmm. she's like, you, you know, this is your, um, this is your closure. Your closure is this. So that's where I was like, oh my God, I'm in the middle of my book. And until I get to the end of this, until there's a, 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 re- a real reckoning, if you will, then mm-hmm. I'm in the middle of the story. And so my closure comes from leaving reality TV better than I found it. And I won't ever be able to close this door until I do that. And so that's what I mean mm. by finishing my story. It, it isn't about yeah. me. 
but it has to be a personal connection to me. And, um, you know, those people who, who think they know anything about it or don't want to have their eyes open to it or are that like, just, just get out of the way. Like, that's all I have to say to you, get out of the way. And, and I mean, it's hundred percent okay to do something that's helping other people like you're doing and do it for selfish reasons too. You know what I mean? So if this is your story that you are getting something out of it, that's fine too. Like, I don't think anyone ever starts uh, something like this without, you know, some personal reason why they're doing it. So I guess uh, I hadn't thought of, I mean, my personal reason was I can't believe that they did this to me and they did this to Danielle and they're never going to do it to anybody else. And so it became mm-hmm. about everybody else and I lacked and it, right. it kind of, it gave me what it was doing was it was like pulling my motivation away. It became right. another thing that I'm like just re triggering and traumatizing myself talking about this over and over and over and listening to other people. And, um, you know, that's why I was like, well, I have to find out my why, like if I don't have a why for this and my why is other people, that's not going to work for me long term, and I'm going to leave. And I, I, you know, I considered it a lot. I considered just, um, you know, kind of withdrawing from it and trying to, to get out of it. But now I have a new look at it and it's been, you know, a year of head to the head in the sand, fighting for all this stuff, doing all these interviews, talking to all these cast members, paving the way for these lawsuits and paving these ways to get labor law changed and all of this stuff. And it just became very almost transactional. And, um, I would say this to anyone too, like when you're, when your life and what you do becomes transactional, I would take a step internal and make sure this is something that actually has some meaning to you and fulfills your values. Cause it's very difficult if you don't have a personal connection to something that's taking up so much of your time. Mm-hmm. And I found myself sometimes kind of doing the opposite where it's like, I started the podcast and I'm talking to people for me, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it was like very selfish reasons why I started it. And then people are telling me, you know, like, oh, you're making a difference and you're doing, you know, all these wonderful things. And it adds and a level positive of responsibility feedback. that you have it, too. It does. And it's like, well, that's just bonus because <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, people are getting something out of it. Awesome. Yeah. But uh, really, I kind of started it because. I needed free therapy. <laughs> you know, it, was it was all of that. Yeah. yeah. But so, but it's okay. You, things could be more than one thing. Right. So that's exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so. congratulations, man. It, well, thank I'm, you. It, thank you. I'm incredibly proud of you and I'm incredibly proud of, you know, everyone involved at, with you can. And I'm, I mean, you've, I, I, I shudder to think if you hadn't started, you can, I mean, people would just, it would just be, continuing right like and the amount of people that have told us that it's mm -hmm. it's crazy it's and that's the thing too like with you and what you're saying with your podcast there's like a level of responsibility that i feel when people are like thank you lead me we trust you i trust you with my story like the amount Mm -hmm. of like the podcast i'm recording later today like i i told this person thank you for trusting me i always tell them thank you for trusting me with your story because mm-hmm. the thing with reality TV and a lot of people get quote a villain Elliot at it, they feel misrepresented. And I know everyone can relate to like feeling misrepresented or like someone doesn't understand you or you're not being seen or you're not being heard. But mm-hmm. when you're made edited that way to be misrepresented on purpose to a large audience across the whole world, the element of you speaking and, you know, with the NDAs and with all the potential legalities of it, the, uh, the fact that you choose to speak against a narrative that everybody has a a belief in, in true, like there's responsibility that comes with that. And if I come in and I don't give someone the space to tell the truth of their story or their narrative of who they are, I'm no better than, the production company, right? Like Mm -hmm. I'm no better than that. And so I, you know, I take a lot of, there's, there's a lot of responsibility with this too. So it's like the same with you have people you're helping with your podcast. It gives you a level of responsibility to do right by 
those people and your guests and yourself and, and all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. I could get into more of that stuff, but <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, you're, I'm always very careful. I'm not exploiting my guests. Right. I'm trying to, yeah. Even though they might have a fantastical story or something, but it's like, yeah, you don't want to, I don't want to do that. But well, you know, I have this personal policy too, which people, man, it's getting a walk. We're getting some wild looking weather out here today. I have this personal policy <laughs> with like reality cast members. I don't actually ask them to come on my podcast unless they right. express interest or ask, because mm -hmm. I don't, I don't want them to think that I am trying to exploit them um, mm -hmm. for, right. you know, my own podcast. My podcast doesn't make any real money. So it's not, it's not even, <laughs> You know, I've, I've accepted oh, I know that. that. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, um, yeah. Cause I don't want to exploit people for myself or for you can either, you know, it's just mm -hmm. not, it's not in my nature. So I, the part I love about what you did with you can was you've given people permission to openly talk about this stuff and, you know, yeah. shed light on what was happening and is happening and what needs to be changed. So like I said, like those hundred people that reached out to you, they would have they would have had nowhere to go over this last year, most, and so most of them so you've by being that trailblazer, you've given permission for other people to go. Wait a minute, my time in reality TV kind of sucked, or the you know the outcome of being on the TV sucked, and yeah. I took it. I was taken advantage of. So, and my hope kudos. too is the way I'm thinking about it now is like, and this is from a podcast <laughs> guest that I had recorded with yesterday. Um, Dr. Uh, Paul Rivera is his name. And he, he, he coined the trailblazer thing, right? And it's like, you're making a road where there's no road, and you're building the road. So there's a road for the people that come behind you. And that's kind of how I'm, I think that resonated with me. So even if it is just a trail, even if it's not a road you've made yet, at least now you've gotten people on your side to then behind you, improve that road even more mm -hmm. and behind them, there'll be someone that can improve it even more and even more. And pretty soon you'll have this. So now you know, you've basically put this road under construction for a hundred years, like all the major highways in this country, in our country. <laughs> 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 but yes, that's, that's a great point. Oh, well, congratulations. Okay. So my story, um, is it's called a psychologist explains the issue with mental health, quote unquote, hyper awareness. It's Mark Travers, and this was in Forbes magazine. Uh, he says, despite this commendable shift towards openness, a strange trend has occurred. As our collective consciousness around mental health issues has expanded, so too has their prevalence. Are we inadvertently normalizing mental health struggles to the extent that they become an expected aspect of life? So we were kind of talking about this. I was going to say, this is an extension. Was it last of episode? One of the last couple. Yeah. Uh, he's a, in... And in doing so, we are exacerbating the very issues we want to address. Uh, interpreting normal levels of anxiety as being indicative of an anxiety disorder may lead to behavioral avoidance, which can further amplify anxiety. The cyclical process of inter interpretation and symptom exacerbation then fuels further awareness efforts, ultimately creating a feedback loop of intensified focus on mental health issues. This prompts individuals to become overly alert, cynical, and on the lookout for anything that rings a psychological bell, creating a self-fulfilling prophecy that is now referred to as the prevalence inflation hypothesis. Uh, so he said he thinks the major thing is social media because a lot of, I mean, I've gotten a lot of great education from social media, but people go on social media, they like these things, then the algorithm then shows you more of that stuff. Yep. So then you self-diagnose yourself. So then you go and see a doctor and they say, no, you don't have it. So now you don't trust the healthcare system. That's already kind of failing in a lot of ways. And then <sighs> you go back to social layer. media to get validation and the cycle continues. So that's his take on that. And it is concerning. Well, <laughs> I, I, mean, I think there's another layer to that <laughs> medical piece too, where at least here in this country, big pharma is like, advert they advertise like right. you can't you can't watch a program or go online and at least in my algorithm and not see like antidepressant 
commercials and ads. And then, oh, if you're an antidepressant, not enough. Here's a Bilify. And so then they go to the mm-hmm. doctors and they incentivize them to prescribe specific things for, you know, whatever. And then you you go in and and you're like, I'm depressed. And, you know, they ask you a couple questions and then write you a script, right? And mm-hmm. and so what happens then is you're incentivizing both sides, right? You're incentivizing, <laughs> not even incentivizing, yeah. you're, you're marketing to someone who's going to then go to the doctor who's then incentivized to do it. And it's like, well, are we actually like, hel- is this helping? And it's the same on the social media side or people that pop to different doctors, which I do think it's good to get more than one opinion. Don't get me wrong there, but it is, it's a mm-hmm. weird cycle. Yeah. And yeah, it is weird. Cause it's like, okay, so more people are getting help that need the help, but also you're also creating like this weird complex too, that everybody thinks they need, they, they're not, I shouldn't feel sad once in a while or have or any kind anxious, of anxiety. Yeah. yeah. Um, or, you know, I don't know how many people are self-diagnosing themselves with ADHD and OCD and everyone, uh, all this everyone stuff. Is. So, yeah, um, so, yeah, it's a double-edged sword for well, sure. Well, then on top of that, you have people diagnosing other people that have no credentials or mm-hmm. training whatsoever to do that with social media. I do mm-hmm. think it's like a <clears throat> Dr. Isabel wrote an article about this, like for psychology today, I think it was psychology today. And she was basically saying like all of this therapy speak that people are using now is like creating new meanings for the words, essentially Mm. like everyone, Mm -hmm. every one of your exes isn't a narcissist. Like that's a Mm -hmm. real personality disorder that should be um, not thrown around the way that it is stuff like that. It's, I think it can, I think we have to. Yeah. Yeah. I saw a really funny thing this really funny video the other day on Instagram. I think I posted all my stories, but it's like two women drinking wine and they're like, I think the waiter forgot her water. He's a narcissist. Oh, he is a narcissist. Yeah. He's not holding space for us. Oh, he's not. <laughs> and they just, all these kind of trendy yeah. psychological words, they, they, they're, they're throwing into this. Goofy and I feel video like and- sometimes people like wear it as a badge of honor. And, well, that's and, right. and that's a fine line of like advocating. Cause I do, I do see people, Like myself, I'm open about depression, right? But Mm -hmm. I don't wear it as a badge of honor, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't think if I do, someone tell me, but that's not my point with it, right? So I think that's also a a weird line to toe. Because he he did mention that in uh, in the article too, Mm -hmm. that it is like, it's almost like trendy. And so you have to get on that trend. And um, yeah, and a lot of people make it their identity, Yes, that's what I maybe was some at. people maybe some people should right like that is pretty much their identity. I don't know. It seems like it's my identity, but only because I have the podcast but and I'm trying to push mental health stuff. But yeah, but I've never uh, heard you define yourself by it. Like that's if you're making something right, your identity, yeah, you're yeah. defining it. You're working within what you can't, what you what you have, and what you live with, right? And you're not yeah, yeah. you're not using it as an excuse to to get something, I guess. Right. Or get special sex. treatment or attention or anything like, yeah, whatever, whatever that Except might be. For sex. I'm like, I'm so depressed. I need sex. I don't think that, <laughs> I don't think that one would work. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, Oh, well, <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah, I don't think it would work either. So, so anyway, it was, it was kind of nice running into that article because we just did kind of have that discussion and he put it more eloquently than perhaps I did. Yeah, earlier, it's but. a fine line. I, I think it's a fine line of like finding the advocacy and the normalization, but not empowering um, self-diagnosis, diagnosis of others without credentials and changing the literal meaning of words by misusing them. I, I think maybe any kind of major progress in anything, maybe there is a there is a kind of a timeline of where it does become trendy. Mm -hmm. And then once the trend drops off, then how the movement started or why the movement started does stick. I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. So then, I mean, ultimately I think it'll be a good thing once the trend kind of goes away, but anyway. Um, So yeah, Mm -hmm. we, we, our shows are getting longer and longer. We're getting more chatty. I think I'm getting, I think it's me. I'm getting, I'm finding things that are like, 
you have hot takes on. Yeah, I actually have hot takes on. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, If you have any comments or articles or questions or feedback, uh, please let us know. Our contacts are in the show notes. And if you would like to watch this episode, be sure to go onto Nick's YouTube Eyes Wide Open channel. Eyes Wide Open content, yes. Okay. But the link's below. Yeah, yeah. Check out all the links. Uh, So until next time, thanks for listening and watching. Peace. This has been our Mental Health Headline Hot Takes. We're so glad you came. Remember, when you heal yourself, you heal the world. Be sure to like this video, leave comments, and suggest articles for future episodes. Hit subscribe to Eyes Wide Open. And Bunny Hugs and Mental Health.